Good morning, church. Before I uh, begin the sermon, I want to remind those of you that are keen on this kind of thing that uh, on the 9th to the 11th of August this year in Auckland, we're hosting our very first digital discipleship conference for this territory. Until now, you will have heard me going over to one in Australia, and I'm going to tell you a little story about that in a moment. But um, just an invitation that if any of you are wanting to go to that, uh, looking at how we implement the gospel in the digital space for the sake of salvation, for the sake of all the good things that happen face to face here in church, but in the digital space, we're going to be doing that on that weekend, 9 to 11 August. And it is, registrations are still open, so please have a chat with me if you think that's you and you want to learn about that space. All right, today we are continuing this journey, C's 165, C's 165. Uh, David put the challenge out to you. I heard him saying, Adrian, uh, don't tell them, ask them. So what does the 165 represent? Sorry, what's that, Jan? A week less three hours. Those three hours are spent here at church, right? 24 times 7 is 168 minus the three hours we spend here. Leaves us with 165 hours outside of the church environment. And the, the thesis of this whole series, part number four today, the thesis of this entire series is that our spiritual experience does not revolve around these three hours. The spiritual experience of the Christian flows through all 168 hours of the week that we are and all that we have and all the time that is given given to us is a gift from God, that we belong to Him, that we are the very presence of the kingdom of God in the lives of those who have not yet received the King of kings and the Lord of lords, right? That you and I, whether we're in the workspace or whether we're in the family space or whether we're in the hobbies and recreation space or whether we're here at church, that we are the ambassadors, we are the representatives, we are the mouthpiece for God, the example, the, the Bible that others will read. You and I have the privilege of being God's representatives in those spaces. Spaces, right, And so we've spoken about those 165 hours outside of here at church. Here we refresh. Here in these three hours, we are rejuvenated. We come into a very special fellowship experience with each other, a very focused experience with God, right, on the Sabbath day in his house. But there's another 165 hours outside of this space that actually belongs to God. And the calling for the Christian is to live as one who is a friend, a disciple of Christ at all times of the week so that we are not merely religious, but truly spiritual. And so in our conversations and in our relationships, remembering that whether you're doing the deal for financial gain or whether you're on the sports field or wherever you find yourself, Live as Christ would live, speak as Christ would speak, and call to the lost as Christ would call to the lost. All right, so as I said, I'm going to tell you a little story. So I jumped on the plane two weekends ago and uh, started to fly over to Australia. Now, the thing that you may or may not know, I think I've mentioned it before, but by nature, and you, you might not pick this if you don't know me well, but by nature, I'm actually an introvert. I um, find people tiring. <clears throat> you know, extroverts find people energizing. Uh, I find people tiring. I am quite happy to sit in my corner while the world passes me by. You know, give me a computer screen or a book or something like that. That's me or doing my woodwork projects at the house, out in my little corner of the backyard, that's me. Now, I know that that may not be the side of me you see often, but I'll tell you how bad it was when I was younger. I was the type of guy in high school who didn't have a lot of friends. I was the guy who had two or three friends, very close friends. I, do not know, I did not know how to start up a conversation with a stranger. That was like the scariest thing you could possibly compel me to do. I'm glad my parents didn't figure that out because I'm pretty sure that for every time I got into trouble, they would have compelled me to talk to a stranger. And that would have just pulled me right into line. <laughs> so that was me through high school. And then I had my conversion experience and I became a Christian and I had this burden, especially because I came out of the drug world and the drug culture, to go back into that space as an ambassador for Christ and to be able to be his influence 
for those who were still lost. And in essence, what that translates into is a call to ministry. I did not know that when I studied theology, I would be compelled to become a pastor because I would not have done that had I known that. Because there's people involved. In fact, I remember in my first year studying theology that I almost dropped out because we did a class on Christian witnessing, which involved going door to door and um, speaking to strangers. And I wrestled with this and I spoke to my professor about this and he was was pretty clear that if I was going to go into ministry, I was going to have to deal with people. You know, like, don't get me wrong, there's certain people that I connect with, and those are the ones I wanted to minister to, but the the stranger and the, it was scary to me, it was dreadfully scary to me. And I almost dropped out of ministry. The only reason I kept studying for ministry was because I loved the subject matter. Does that make sense? And so when I graduated, I didn't go into pastoral work. I went overseas and continued studying in another place and in another space because I wasn't going to go into ministry. But over the years and over time, God, with a sense of humor, has placed me in situations where I've developed a heart for people and where I've learned the skills of being able to talk to strangers and start a conversation with people and overcome at least to some small extent, not entirely, the fear of rejection. Does anybody else relate to that fear? I think it's one of the biggest fears that stops us from being a powerful witness for Christ is the fear of rejection. It's still a work in progress for me, but we're on that journey. So with that backstory in mind, when I get on a plane, I want to sit in my seat, I want to watch a movie, and I don't want to talk to anyone. But you see, three weeks ago, we started a series called Seize 165. So when I got on that plane to go to Australia, I kind of knew that if I've preached to you, I better practice it myself, right? So anyway, I got my seat assignment and I sat down and as uh, luck would have it, there was an empty seat next to me, which was great. And I sat down and began the flight. Now, when I walked into my seat, right, so you come down the plane, this little flying uh, um, what do you call it, a, a, a deodorant can. You know, that's what they look like with wings on them. So you walk down the aisle and you find your seat and uh, the guy who's sitting there, he, I, was the, uh, I was on quite late and so there was already a guy sitting there and when he stood up to let me on, I went down and I sat next to him and I'd been given this little piece of paper you have to fill out for customs. You know, when you land in the next country, you know, have you been in any place, you've got dirt stuck on your foot, all that kind of stuff, right? And so I didn't have a pen on me. So I leaned over to the guy next to me and I said to him, hey, do you have a pen? Yeah, sure. So he reaches down under the seat in front of him and he takes out what looks like a a Bible cover, you know, a Bible and a cover. And he opens it and he takes out one of the pens. And I'm pretty sure it's a Bible that I saw, but it was all quite a quick transaction. So I sat down, filled out my paperwork and off we take, we're flying. And and, um, sure enough, as the flight's taken off, he takes out this book from underneath there, opens it up and he's reading 2 Corinthians. Which was interesting because I had started reading 2 Corinthians and so, so I'm looking at this, I'm kind of spying on him, you know, I'm like I'm twisting my eyes as far to the side without turning my head as I can, you know, trying to not be too obvious. And eventually, uh, I, you know, I click, okay, he is reading the Bible. So I noticed that his wife was sitting on the other side of the aisle, they had three young kids with them, and um, so I leaned over to him and I said to him, um, so where are you guys off to? I see you've got your family over here. Is this your family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wife, three kids. I said, oh, we're off to Australia. And so I said to him, well, what are you going for? Oh, no, we're just going over a family break. In-laws are taking us, etc., etc." And we start a conversation with that. And those questions were intentional because most people would pick up the cue. When you've asked them why they're going, typically, unless they do not want to talk to you, what will they ask? Why are you going? And I was waiting for it. So he said to me, and so what, are you, what brings you to Australia? I said to him, oh, I'm going to a digital discipleship conference. Now, this would not have been my usual way to deal with this, but I'd seen him reading a Bible, right? Now, I figured if I can't talk to a guy who's reading a Bible, there is something seriously wrong with me. That's like as easy as it gets, surely. So I said to him, I'm going to a digital discipleship conference, and he kind of he looked at me and he wasn't quite sure he heard what I said. He said, what? What conference? 
digital discipleship. And then he was like, oh, you saw me reading the Bible, right? Because obviously discipleship, Bible, you know. And that started about an hour-long conversation. It turns out that this young man named Todd is... uh, a relatively new Christian. He's witnessing in the workplace. He is part of a, a, a Sunday keeping fellowship down in Invercargill, and his children go to the Seventh day Adventist school down there. How bizarre is that? So we start talking about this, and I'm, of course, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I'm going over to the Seventh-day Adventist event, and we start exchanging notes, and we start sharing our faith with one another, and it turns out to be this, this another step in his, what I think is his journey as God continues to lead and to guide him. You see, these are the conversations wherever we find ourselves in the 165 hours when we're not in this space that we need to seize for the kingdom of God, the opportunities for us to introduce someone or be a part of someone's journey towards Christ, to encourage them in that journey. Now, as I said to you, the point of this is that was actually quite a hard thing for me to do. And when you, the way you know me here, because I am amongst family here, I'm hardly, I'm not very intimidated and I am quite outgoing and I'm quite easy to talk to, at least I think I am, and I find you quite easy to talk to. And so you might think, but Adrian, that's just what would be perfectly normal for you to sit on a plane and talk to a stranger. No, it wouldn't be. I did a hard thing. Now, I've just said it was as easy as it could be because he was reading a Bible, but it was a hard thing for someone like me. Then you get my wife and others who are extroverts, and they just strike up conversations like super easy. The point of what I want to share with you today under the Seize 165 banner is I want to encourage you to do hard things. Things that take you beyond what you're comfortable with. And there's at least five categories of hard things that I want to share with you. Five things. And you can divide just about everything in life into these five areas. When we talk about doing hard things for the kingdom, when we talk about the 165 hours outside of this church building where we are to go forth and to be disciples in the marketplace and in the play place and wherever we find ourselves, you're going to find that there are five ways that you and I are called to do hard things. Now, if you want the notes to this and a far greater expansion of this, I want you to encourage, I want to encourage you to buy a book. A book. That's right. How many of you remember that I gave away all my books a little while ago? Do you remember me advertising that? You know, this is the strange thing about this sermon. I gave away every book I own except my Bible collection, right? And after I'd given them all away, one book was left. I don't know how it didn't get taken, but I looked up and there it was. There was one book left. So I figured, if I only have one book left, maybe I should read it. You know, it's like my only book. So I started reading it one Sabbath, and that gave birth to this message. It's called, wait for it, Do Hard Things. It's by twin brothers. They were twins, they are twins, and they, in their teens, got tired of what they call teen mediocrity. Tired of the expectation that teenagers are somewhere in between children and somewhere in between adults, and the only thing a teenager is supposed to do is party and have a good time and be selfish. They said, no, we're teens, and we don't think that that's right. They were Christian teens, and they, they, they studied the Scriptures, and they realized that in Scripture, you have the category of child, and you have the category of adult, and there's nothing in between. They realized that God was calling them as teens to be his disciples. So I want to encourage you as parents, if you have kids growing up, and I want to encourage you young people, get this book. It will change your life. It's called Do Hard Things. And what I'm going to share with you are the five categories of hard things that they identify in their book that apply to this idea of seizing the 165 hours outside of church for God. The first kind of hard thing is the obvious kind, the kind that takes you outside your comfort zone, the kind of thing that you're not used to, the kind of thing that for an introvert is like talking to a stranger, right? It's the kind of thing like, like maybe, you, maybe you don't get out much and, and, you're, and you could go explore a new place. When I was in South Africa, I came into contact with a lady who uh, had experienced some trauma as a result of a a car accident or two. She spent her entire life inside the house. 
she would not, as a result of this trauma, she would not venture out. The house and her porch were the limits of her space. She would not go out to buy food. She would not go shopping. She would not go out to see people. She would not go out, period. Sometimes the hardest thing we're called to do is walking out the front door of our homes. Going out into a space that's not inside of our comfort area. Maybe it's, maybe it's the opportunity to speak publicly. Now that's bizarre, right? How does an introvert have no problem speaking publicly? And yet his challenge is speaking to the stranger one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't have to make sense to you. Every single one of us have our own uniquenesses, our struggles, our comfort zones, the walls in which we live. And sometimes in order to, to seize the 165 for God, we have to be willing to adventure beyond those walls of safety and security, the comfort zone that we've made for ourselves. Maybe it's learning a new skill or expanding an old one. And the verse that I want to share with you is found in Matthew chapter 10. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to have a few verses in Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 10. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Sorry, that's chapter 9. No wonder that doesn't make any sense. Matthew chapter 10. And I'm looking here at verses 5 to 10. Jesus sent out the twelve, instructing them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, listen to this, listen to this. As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worthy of his support." Do you hear what Jesus is saying to his 12? I mean, these were fishermen, right? These were practical workers. One was a tax collector, a finance man. Now they're called to follow Jesus. They leave their comfort zone to follow a man they don't know a whole lot about, to go on an adventure they really don't have a clue about yet. And then he says to them, now I want you to go... I want you to go without me. I want you to go and take this message further. I want you to do things you've never done before. I want you to, 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 to go in the authority of the kingdom and to cast out demons. I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to experience interactions with people that may leave you feeling rejected, dejected, or down. I want you to go. And by the way, I don't want you to go with a whole lot of cash in your back pocket as a backup or a whole lot of extra clothes in your suitcase. I want you to go as you are, as you stand right now. I'm calling you to go without any human provision. I'm asking you to go and I'm asking you to do something you've never done it before in an environment you're not that familiar with. And I want you to just go and trust God with it. Is that going outside of their comfort zone? Man, that, that would have petrified me. Like we read this, oh, wouldn't it have been awesome to see demons cast out and, and lepers healed and, and all of those cool things done in the name of the gospel. Yeah, we all want to do that. Are you going to be bold enough for the kingdom to be the person through whom it's done? Are you going to be the one that steps up? And Do you just want to watch it happen around you? Or are you going to, be, or are you going to, are you going to receive the call of Christ to actually go in his strength and in his power? This is a very, very uncomfortable text to me. I read it with admiration when I'm looking at it in the past. But when I think about what it might mean for today, I'd prefer to move on to another portion of exciting story in the Bible. So one area that sometimes when we're seizing the 165, God's calling to is just plain and simple. Go outside of your comfort zone. Do something you don't usually do. Break up your routine and your rhythm. Try something. The second area we'll find in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaking to the crowd here, and he says in verses 38, 38 to 42, he says, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I say to you, do not resist him who is evil, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. And if anyone wants you wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. And whoever shall force you to go one mile, go with him 
two miles. And give to him who asks of you. And do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You know, this is in essence Jesus saying, go beyond the minimum expectation. One of the hard things to do is to go beyond the minimum expectation. A hard thing to do to go outside of your comfort zone and a still harder thing to actually go beyond the minimum expectation. And here's why. Because a minimum expectation is a norm. No one's expecting you to go beyond a minimum expectation. Right? You can do the minimum and everyone will look at you and pat you on the back. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. I want to challenge you to go beyond the minimum. I don't want you to look around at society and go, well, society says that's all that's expected of me, so that's all I'll do. He says, no, the Christian's vision is bigger than that. If you're going to seize the 165 for God, you've got to go beyond the bare minimum that's socially acceptable, the norms of today. You need to go with the vision in the eyes of Jesus. So this guy wants you to walk a mile with him. And in those days they could. The Roman army could compel anyone to carry their load for them up to a mile. And when you get to the end of the mile, what do you do? You ceremoniously dump it right there. And you make a point about walking away. You've got no more claim over me. And Jesus says, that's what society would have you do. But the heart of true service would mean you'd go, Okay, I'll keep going with you. I'll go the extra mile. That's where we get the expression from. So what does it look like in our world to go an extra mile? Kids at school or at university, well, maybe it's more than just getting the bare minimum passing results. Maybe it's setting a goal for you that's higher than that. Or maybe, or maybe staying late at work to help a colleague without getting paid just because you know that they're stuck in some aspect of their employment or some aspect of their work, having a heart of service like that. You're not expected to do that. It's not your domain. No one can compel you to do it, but maybe I can go above and beyond. Maybe we can volunteer our time and skills in a church ministry. And by the way, as I've said in previous episodes of the series, that's exactly how church happens. It is because people are going above and beyond. And you know what? I know for a fact that there are some people who serve in positions in this church not because they're particularly passionate about it. Not because it's like, I just wake up in the morning on Sabbath and go, I got to get there and do this. But they do it because they know that in this season of life, there's a calling on their life. You know, I think uh, Leanne's intro this morning, unknowingly, because we haven't coordinated what we would say, unknowingly actually sets this idea up. The world pursues happiness as if it's entitled to happiness. And if you're not happy, stop doing what you do. If you're not happy in your marriage, bail on it. If you're not happy, if whatever makes you happy, do it. Whatever doesn't make you happy, don't do it. That is not the Christian call. That is not the Christian call. You are not to live for your happiness. And God's primary objective is not your happiness. Although it is a byproduct of finding yourself in the will of God. But it's not the ultimate pursuit. Does that make sense? So I'm grateful to the, for the fact that in this church, there are those who already go above and beyond. They are already in the space where... They are serving and putting themselves out there. Kids, maybe you can take up some household chore that you haven't been asked to do. (laughs) And by the way, I actually had a very pleasant surprise this week. One of my children actually did that. Without being asked, without being told, I came home one evening to the story from my wife, that after she had got up from having a headache being on the bed, she found the place tidied up, cleaned up, even the pantry was sorted. We're hoping it's a trend. (laughs) Hey, going above and beyond may look like practicing generosity to someone who's in need. Or maybe even just as simple as yielding your parking spot to another driver. You see, these things are difficult. Things in this category are difficult because because they have to result from personal motivation, 
No one else is putting pressure on you. Everybody else says you're okay doing the minimum. But there's something within you. The Spirit of God within you compels you to something more, to something better. And, and none of us will even know that you've denied that if you didn't do it because you were doing the minimum. And that's what makes this category so hard. It's entirely based on your heart and your walk with God. A third category of things that are difficult, I think, are found in Matthew chapter 28. And I probably don't even need to read it, but I will anyway. Matthew 28, the last part of the chapter, and you'll know exactly where it is. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I've commanded you, and remember I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, I think that this is not only the gospel commission, but I'm using it as an example of the third category. Do things that are too big for you to do alone. Do things that call you outside of your own resources that compel you to enter into a relationship, a partnership, and reliance with others. The Gospel Commission is the quintessential example of that. Can you imagine Jesus going up, and while he's talking to them, he's saying to them, by the way, in the time while I'm away, I, I, you know, you've gone out to Jerusalem before, I now want you to go to all the Gentile nations, I want you to circle the globe, I want you to go everywhere where there's a human being, I want you to tell them the story of Jesus, don't Fear, I will be with you, but I don't just want you to tell them. I want you to disciple them. That means I want you to be in their lives. I want them to be in your lives. I want you to live amongst them. I want you to, to adopt them. I want them to be your people and you to be their people. I want you to be the kingdom of God across the world. You're not just going to wait in passivity for me to come back. I'm sending you out to the entire world. And you're thinking, thank God that he didn't say that to only one person. No, he gave the entire charge for the whole world to 12, which isn't much better. Or maybe 70 if the extended group was there, or the 120. But when you think of the world, he might as well have said it to one. Jesus gives them a task that is so far beyond them that number one, they're going to have to work in alliance with each other. And number two, they're going to have to work in dependence upon him. I think that sometimes our dreams are simply too small. They're good as far as they go, but we only dream as far as we can imagine ourselves doing. If you want to seize the 165 for God, you've got to dream dreams that are bigger than you. Dreams that are bigger than you alone, but you in partnership with God, in partnership with others. Organize a rally. Make a statement in society. Make a film together with other people. Change an organization's policy on some matter that's not in harmony with, with Scripture or with the principles we live by. Start a music group. That's already happened in our church. Start a music group or a band. Do something that's bigger than just you alone. Take on some social justice issue like modern day slavery or abortion or poverty. Something that's, that, 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 that needs to change in the world. These are big things. Be the presence of God in the world around you. It's difficult because the size of the task is daunting and we're compelled to enter into partnership with others. You know the old saying, if you want a job done right? Yeah, this is the opposite of that. Take on a job that's so big that it can't be done by yourself. With all the challenges that come with that. And by the way, when you become a part of church fellowship, when you become a part of this thing, that's exactly what we've done. We are the disciples tasked with this gospel commission. We have entered into a relationship of dependence upon each other and dependence upon God. We are this place with all its imperfections and those imperfections surface precisely because we are committed to one another in this mutual relationship of dependence called by God. You see, and that's why your imperfections show up and my imperfections show up, and we can't just withdraw into our corners and go, well, I'm not going to be a part of that anymore. No, because the task is too big for you, and it's too big for me, and no matter what our struggles are, our sanctification, our growth, the perfection that Christ has for us, happens in the context of this great big mission that's too big for us. We rub up against each other. We discover things good about each other. We discover things that are bad about each other. We discover brokenness. We discover the journey of healing. And it's all done 
together. Together. Church is the ultimate example, I think, of being part of something that's too big for one person by themselves. Jump with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 to 11. Paul here writes something that's very insightful. Of course, it's a specific historical context that he's referring to, his relationship with the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 to 11. <clears throat> he says, We do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. They believed they were going to die under this oppression. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He also delivered us from such great apparel of death and will deliver us again. He on whom we have set our hope and he will yet deliver us. You also joining and helping us through your prayers that thanks may be given to many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed upon us through the prayers of the many. You know, another category of doing hard things is this idea that not everything delivers an immediate reward. A category of hard things to commit to are things that have no immediate payoff. And this is the story he's telling us here. He's gone out. He's fulfilling the gospel commission that we read about in Matthew chapter 28. He's gone where God has sent him. He's gone outside of his comfort zone. He's, he's doing hard things. And then those hard things aren't even paying off in the foreseeable future. In fact, the only thing he seems to be gaining from it is hardship, pain, suffering, persecution, being locked up, thinking he's going to die, having to trust God because there is no human agency to come to his rescue. There is no social welfare system. There is no one that's going to have compassion on him. There's not even a good, strong church infrastructure in the places he's going because he's going into unentered areas for the sake of the gospel. One of the hardest categories of things to do are things that don't deliver an immediate reward. Because I'll tell you what, we live in an age of instant gratification. Just yesterday, I was driving past the Honda dealership. And you know, they've got their adverts up there in bright lights, right? And their whole, the whole slogan around one of their vehicles or their models there is this idea, no deposit, immediate drive away. And I thought to myself, that's the world we live in. We live in a world that is obsessed with instant reward and instant gratification. That's why we have so much credit card debt. Isn't it? Because you don't have to save. You don't have to sacrifice. You just load it up. I'm not criticizing if you've got credit card debt. I've got that problem too. I'm just saying to you that that's the world we live in. A world of instant gratification. So it makes sense to me that we're seeing less and less people and it's more and more noteworthy with the few that are stepping up to do things that require commitment over time without instant gratification. You think of the amazing stories, the positive stories you hear on the news. What is it? It's about people who have just done something, stuck with something, not always an easy thing to do. And a long time later, somebody finally realizes this person's really doing something unusually good. And it wasn't for their selfish gain. And it wasn't because there was an instant reward. Those stories stand out to us because our culture is so oriented toward instant gratification. And scripture calls us to play the long game. Scripture calls us to have a vision that goes beyond this life. Scripture calls us to seize the 165 hours outside of church for God, recognizing that he's not calling you to live for your comfort. He's not calling us to live for our own gratification. He's calling us to build the kingdom for eternity. And sometimes that requires time and energy and spaces that don't yield an instant pat on the back. Hey, a few examples off the top of our head here. Overcoming sin is one of those journeys. 
The call to live in such a way that day by day we take steps of progress towards becoming Christ-like. The call to lay aside the sins that have been with us for years. And God's tapping us on the shoulder and saying, now is the day I want you to yield this. And tomorrow he says, and now is the day I want you to yield the next thing. It's that journey of ongoing. It's not always easy. It doesn't feel good in the moment. It feels like we're chopping off our right hand or our left hand because we're so accustomed to living this way. He's calling us outside of our comfort zone, but particularly in this area of doing the hard thing that doesn't yield an instant gratification. You go talk to any drug addict about when they quit their drugs. They didn't just walk away from it and go, man, I feel so much better already. They went through a period of withdrawal and struggle and processing and all sorts of things happened inside of them. It took weeks of intensity, months of ongoing journey, sometimes years, but somewhere in that journey, down the road, they say, praise the Lord, I never want to go back there again. Overcoming sin is the classic example of doing a hard thing that doesn't have an immediate payoff. Being diligent and faithful in one's spiritual disciplines is another one. That's an area I struggle, to be honest. The busyness of life, the rat race, the everything else. Skip a day here, skip a day there, a week here, a month there, a year here. You don't see the fallback immediately. And you also don't, when you start it again, don't see, oh, suddenly now I'm back in that super spiritual place, right? Doing your, your, your being regular in your daily devotions in a spiritual journey with Christ. It doesn't seem to yield an instant hit of adrenaline or of euphoria or of overcoming power. But as you walk with him consistently, something happens in your heart. Changes become reality. What about the old belly, eh? Getting in shape. I started running this week. I decided that on my 41st birthday, I should probably start. Because I've heard this idea that what you do on your birthday, you do for the rest of the year. Turns out within the week, I figured that's not true. I started running. But you know what? I got home and I said to my wife, I said, I went for a run and I haven't lost any weight. Because <laughs> it's one of those things that doesn't yield an immediate result. Does that make sense? It's cumulative over time. Maybe you all can help me be accountable with that one. Being consistent in applying ourselves to a study journey. Oh, here's one for our young people, and hey, maybe even for us older people. Practicing obedience. Also, doesn't seem to yield an immediate reward. In fact, it may even feel like you're cramping my style. But the benefits of obedience over time are powerful. And here's one that's close to my heart. Bringing your family with a heap of young kids to, to, to church every week. Do you know what a struggle that is? I know some of you have had kids and you're thinking, yeah, Adrian, we try to warn you. And there's others of you who haven't had kids. And I'm just telling you, when you get to that place in your life and you've got kids, especially if you have like, you know, a horde of them, here's what you're going to find. Sabbath mornings aren't always fun. They're hard work. And by the time you get through that door there, you are just like, oh, worn out, tired, maybe even angry. You know what? It's not an easy thing to practice the discipline of saying, you know what? I don't go to church because it's my happy place. I don't go there because it's the place where I feel all euphoric. I go there to meet with God and it's going to be the principle of life, the principle of action that we go. Come hell, high water, a fight or whatever happens in the morning that shouldn't happen, we still go. Why? Because it's not about right now and this Sabbath morning. It's about the practice we're passing on to our children, the habits we're teaching them. And a parent understands this. If you're in this world and if you've taken on parenting because you think it's going to be the funnest, most awesome thing to ever do, pop goes that balloon. There are times when it's just downright hard work. But you know what? 
we stick with it and we don't bail on our family and we are there. Why? Because we are not living for instant gratification. We are not living for our own satisfaction. As Christians, we are called, even when it does not feel good, to stick with it. We're called as Christians, even when we wish for our own relaxation and selfish pleasure, to withdraw, whether it's from church or from our families or from anything else. Sometimes it is just plain hard work seizing the 165 for God. But we do it because we have spiritual vision that transcends the hardship of now. And we realize that we are investing in the youngest in the family to teach them to walk with God. You see, things in this category are difficult because there's often little affirmation from people in this journey. Because there's no instant reward. And because we are wired to follow the path of least resistance. Finally, the last category, I want you to turn to Mark. The book of Mark, chapter 6. Back in the gospel. Mark 6, and we're looking at verse 17 to 20. It's a story of John the Baptist, and it goes like this. Herod himself had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death and could not do so. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. And you know how the story goes. A banquet is called, John ends up being beheaded, etc., etc., right? The fifth and the final category, I think, of things that are hard to do, that we're called to in the seizing of the 165 for God, the fifth category is simply to challenge our cultural norms. John here was a pillar of, of, of influence, I mean, it's interesting to me that Herod, Herod was trying to keep him safe, it says. We think of Herod as the guy who locked him up, right? But Herod is keeping him safe and out of touch. And the reason John is in this position is because John has been bold. He's been outspoken. And he's dealing with Herod, who has committed this travesty, you know, gotten involved with his sister-in-law. And John's having the boldness to say to him, that may be okay. Like, I mean, you know, when you read the story of the Caesars of Rome, this was pretty tame, actually, you know. Like the things that the Caesars got up to were insane. The cultural norms of the day, the, the sexual promiscuity, etc. This was, this was just another day in Rome. No one would blink an eyelid at this. We even see it in the book of Corinthians, right? That's, what, that's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians to the Corinthian church and says, you know, guys... You're not even blinking at the fact that there's someone in your midst who's sleeping with his, mother, his, his stepmother that his father's married. Why are you not dealing with this? Why? Because it was just part of the culture. It was so normal that even in the church, to these new Christians, it was just another day. And John here goes out on a limb and he says, I will stand for what is true. I will stand for what is right. I will address this king. And he's just this little guy that comes out of the desert wearing camel hair and living on locusts and honey, right? Like, who is he? He's not a statesman. He's not one of Herod's peers. He's not, he's not, he's not, he doesn't move in the same social circles, but he stands up and he says, actually, I have an opinion on this. And my opinion is that it's out of harmony with the word of God. And it gets him into trouble. That's why this category of hard things is hard to do. Because this category of hard things, of going against the cultural norms, of standing for something that is true, righteous according to Scripture, to be the person that does that is going to cost you your popularity in most cases. If you are going to be this person and you're going to do this for the kingdom of God, it's going to cost you your popularity. All those likes on your Facebook page or your Instagram posts, right? Watch them drain away. All that, hey guys, we don't rock the boat, we all just go together down the stream to death. No, 
Suddenly there's someone standing up on the boat going, guys, we're going the wrong way. Oh, shut up and sit down. This is the much easier way. No, we're going the wrong way. Like, like you're going to be that guy. You're going to be that gal. Now, now I, I just have to also stop here and ask you not to be obnoxious for obnoxious sake. Because there are a fair number of Christians that do that in the name of standing for truth. So just in the interest of balance... I'm asking you to be wise. I'm asking you to be compassionate. I'm asking you to have a heart for people, not just a heart for truth. But I'm saying to you that you and I are called at times to be the voice in the wilderness, even if it gets us locked up, misunderstood, and beheaded. The hardest category of all these fives is to go against the cultural norms. Here's a few examples. What about this radical idea that maybe, that maybe we would even dress differently to the world around us, that we would choose to dress in a way that conceals the body, that would, that would practice the principle of modesty? Or what about this idea that maybe we would choose not to engage in sexual relationships outside of marriage, whether called adultery or fornication before marriage? What about a commitment in our hearts to, to honor marriage, by saying that we won't just move in with somebody because that's the way the world does it and it's okay, but we would actually choose, if this is the one, to do it under the banner of marriage like Scripture has called us to. Or what about, what about maintaining biblical views about contemporary issues like homosexuality or abortion or euthanasia? Big talking points today, isn't it? Right? Or what about living as servants of one another instead of trying to be winners in our relationships. You know, this is what will save marriages, friends, if we will learn to serve one another instead of having to be the winner in the relationship. Going against our cultural norms where male strength means domination and the right to rule. What if it's actually like Ephesians 5 says, men, love your wives like Christ has loved the church. Like it turns strength on its head in Ephesians chapter 5. It says there that the real test of manliness isn't your ability to be the strongest and the most impressive physical presence to demand that she yield, but actually that you sacrifice and lay down your life for the other. That's the definition of biblical strength. What if that was an issue that we as a community of faith exemplified and taught in the streets of our world and in the marketplace and in the workplace? What if we were to practice discernment about our consumption of media and music? And finally, what about just boldly sharing our faith even when we're nervous about it? You know, these are just a few examples just to get your mind thinking about these five areas. What were they again? To go outside of our comfort zone. To do things that are above and beyond the minimum expectations. To take on a call or a project that is beyond the, my ability in myself to accomplish it by myself. The fourth one was this idea of doing things that don't deliver an immediate reward. And finally, doing and standing for things that go against the cultural norms for the sake of the kingdom of God. A story I read recently about a guy by the name of Dwayne. And Dwayne, like uh, where I started with my story, was a theology student. He was going into his senior year of, 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 of uh, theological studies, after which he would be released into the world. And in those days when he was studying, it was the expectation that theology students would do a certain number of weeks canvassing in the field. That is door to door, knocking on doors, selling books, literature, evangelism, and that kind of thing. Dwayne was under financial pressure. He had a good construction job and he needed to work through the summer. This was in the US, right? They go on summer break. He needed to work through summer to pay for the next year of tuition. And he gets a call one day saying, hey, Dwayne, the literature evangelists are here. You haven't yet done your stint in the field. You know that you're not going to be able to graduate without this. You need to come and do this. Will you come and do this? And immediately his response is, no, I cannot afford to do this. I cannot do this now, so I'm not going to do it. So his friend says to him, Dwayne, will you at least pray about it. No, I'm not going to pray about it. There's no ways I'm doing this. It's, it's not God's will for me. I'm not going to pray about it. So his friend says to him, how can you not pray about it? You're a theology student. You have to pray about it. So Dwayne said, okay, I'll pray about it. 
So he and his young wife got together and they decided they'd take it seriously and they'd pray earnestly about it. And Then they did something which I personally wouldn't endorse, but it does seem to be a biblical model. They decided to draw, draw straws, cast lots. So they have a season of prayer and he gets uh, seven pieces of dry spaghetti, breaks one of them, it's a short one, mixes them up in his hands. They have prayer over it and they draw out the straw. Short one comes up. He tells how he was angry. This is rubbish. There's no ways. I don't believe this. So he took the seven pieces of spaghetti and threw them in the trash. He went and got another seven pieces of spaghetti, made one short. They knelt down together and they prayed. And out came the short one. At this point, as upsetting as it was, they decided that's too much to be coincidence, and they decided that this was now the will of God. And so he handed in his resignation to the construction company, signed up to go and do his literature evangelism out in the field, and did that for the entire summer long. Not only does he tell some amazing stories of, of things that happened in that journey, connecting with people and seeing God open up homes and miracles to the gospel, but he says this, by the time they got to the end of their summer break, not only had God blessed sufficiently with those book sales for him to pay for his entire senior year, but also most of his wife's study year. That man has gone on not only to be a pastor in the Lord's service, but to head up a ministry that we all know well. It's called Adventist World Radio. Dwayne McKee is his name. And just a few weeks ago, as a result of that ministry, broadcasting into territories where you cannot go physically, like a little province or an area called Sikkim, where it's just very hostile to the gospel, two young couples gave their lives to the Lord and were baptized in secret. Or... In some jungle in South America somewhere, amongst a group of 250 cartel members, a cartel that deals in drugs and assassinations, 250 of its members gathered on the banks of a river to witness some of their compatriots give their lives to the Lord and turn away from that lifestyle. Because Dwayne chose to do a hard thing. And little did he know that summer, way back then, what God's great plans for him were in the future. Little did he know on, in that summer back then, what kind of adventure awaited him. All he could really know is that it really grated him that God was calling him and had given unmistakable evidence that he was to go into a place that was uncomfortable for him. That he was to give up what he knew was going to be his security. And here's the funny twist. Halfway through that summer, the construction company went bankrupt and closed its doors. Do hard things. Seize the 165 for God. Dream beyond what you can do by yourself. Be willing to go outside of your comfort zone, to take on projects that are bigger than yourself, to stand against the cultural norms. Do hard things. Because if you're willing to do that, those 165 hours that you're not here at church will become the habitation of the Holy Spirit. They will become the place and the, the, the environment where you see the miracles of God's grace working in other people's lives. You will start to have stories to tell that you could never have dreamed possible. And who knows where you are a year, two years, five years, and ten years down the line. Who knows what adventure God has for you if you're willing to stop living by sight and to start living with the anticipation of faith. Do hard things. And seize the 165. May God bless you. As you think on this and as we sing our final song. Take my life and let it be. We'll stand in a moment as we sing.